we reset the room and then we'll get into what we're going to get into here today. Just reminding everybody that you are in Breakfast with Champions where everyone has a seat at the table. We are here for motivation, education, and inspiration. We do this, in case you didn't know, if you are new around here, we do this every day starting at 5 a.m. We also have a, a worshiping show on Sunday. So this is Monday through Saturday. And as you can see, we have a plethora of high level individuals who are in here giving you the game, as I like to say. And if you want to stay up to date on our events, articles from hosts and more, you can sign up for that to get it free to your inbox on a regular basis by going to bwcdaily.com. Again, bwcdaily.com. If you have not already done so, you can do that while you're listening. Now, what I do here, for those of you who don't know, this is a, a gimmick. I say that in a tongue in cheek way that I've been running for the last couple of weeks. And we're going to keep this going is that I take half of this hour and we talk some personal development stuff. Then we take the other second half of this hour and we talk professional development. And what I do is allow the audience here at BWC to vote on what the topic is going to be. So first, let me give you the two topics that you can choose from and you can vote by actually going into the comment section. And before we even do that, as a matter of fact, everyone hit the share button that is right next to the comments at the bottom left corner of your screen. There's a comment that says 343. Right next to that is a share button. Hit that share button and share this room. I don't care where you share it, just share it. I don't care if you send a text, if you post it on Twitter, you post it to LinkedIn, if you share on Clubhouse itself, just share the room out. We want as many people as possible to know what we have going on here at BWC. So everyone, please hit that share button and share the room. Now, the two topics that we're going to vote between here today. Let me see what I got. Hmm. I have so many. All right. So one can be keys to confidence. If you like me to talk about some keys to confidence, put the letter C in the comment section or if I should talk how to increase your stress tolerance, put the letter S in the comment section. So at the bottom left corner of the screen, put the letter C. If I should talk keys to confidence with this first half hour of this segment, or put the letter S. If I should talk how to increase your stress tolerance. And we'll do that for the first uh, half of the segment. Then we'll open a four up for some shares. Then the second half, we'll do the same thing on a uh, professional development slash business topic. Good news about these topics everybody who doesn't know is that you can apply the professional stuff to your personal life. You can apply the personal stuff to your business life. Now, while you all are voting again, C for keys to confidence, S for increasing your stress tolerance. That's what you're voting either C or S in the comment section. While you're doing that, let me introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dre Baldwin. Many know me as Dre all day. I'm a former nine year professional athlete. I'm author of 33 books on four Ted talks, created this whole brand called work on your game. And what we do here is very simple. We extract it the tools, the mental and the strategic tools to help athletes get to the top 1% of the sports world. And we translate those tools over from the sports world to the business world to help professionals like yourselves perform at your highest level, do so consistently. And as a result of that high level performance, consistent high level performance, you're going to make more money in your business. That's what we do here at Work On Your Game. And all the things that we talk about are simply means to the ends of doing those three things that I just said. High level performance done consistently. And as a result, you're making more money because that's the only reason we go to work every day is to make money. Yeah, I know you would do it for free, quote unquote, but if it was for free, you wouldn't be doing it. But anyway, so now let's see what's going on in the comments and let's see what our votes are. I am. Let's see. So we got some C's, some S's, C's. S's. And I'm doing this. I'm eyeballing this. We're still waiting for Clubhouse to add the, the voting uh the voting thing in here so I can actually do polls. They should have that in here, being that this is a open uh, audio app. Let's see, I'm getting a lot of C's. I got some strong C's from Tarika. I see you, Tarika. And then we got some S's too, but I think we'll go with the C. I think confidence is gonna win this one. So we're gonna talk about keys to confidence. Now this one, keys to confidence, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, everybody, just so you know, because I have there are actually 15 points that I have in here. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, these 15 points. And if someone wants to just uh, jot them down in the comment section, that'd be great. If anybody wants to do that or any of you want to go deeper on this subject, I do have some deeper material on this exact same subject that I can point you to after this segment is over. But let's get into it. Keys to confidence. So I'm going to make sure we get to this by 830 so we can get on to the professional development. Now, those of you who are familiar with my work, if you are not, I describe confidence every day in material that I put out as 
your ability to put your, your ability and willingness to put yourself out there boldly and authentically. And I've done uh, two of my four TED Talks are based around confidence. I've written a book about confidence called The Super You. And almost every book that I put out, even the book that you see at the pinned comment that I have here on BWC right now, uh, the third day, confidence is one of the uh, there's a chapter on confidence in there. My book, Work On Your Game, there's a chapter on confidence. I talk about confidence damn near everything that I do. Why? Because confidence is the number one internal trait that people say they want to develop more and they would like to augment if they could. So along with discipline, you're going to find traces of confidence in almost anything that with the Work On Your Game brand on it, from coaching, from books to coaching to everything else. So today we're going to talk about key elements that will help you build and maintain your confidence. All right. So again, you've got 15 points here. So those of you need to want to uh, note these and want to go use these and take note of them. Make sure you're listening fast and we'll be talking pretty quickly. Number one, positive mindset. All right. Confidence is defined as your ability to excuse me, as your belief in your ability to do something. So it would help to have a positive mindset to support that belief. Now, hopefully your positive mindset is based around what you can do and also about your potential for future accomplishments. So the more positive you can stay about yourself, the more things you will try. Therefore, the more things you try, we theorize, the more things you will accomplish. This is assuming that you have a baseline level of ability. So let's not, uh, let's not uh, discount that, that you actually need to have skill. You got to have game. That's why we call it work on your game. Just because you're confident doesn't mean you're going to succeed. But if you're confident and you actually have ability, then things will probably work out. Now, where does this confidence actually come from? Because that ability is supported by your willingness to actually do the work. And what is that? That's the discipline. That's your willingness to show up every single day and do the work. So the more disciplined you are at doing the work, the more confident you afford yourself to be. All right. So number one, positive mindset. And that comes from, again, you're confident because you have you know you have done the work. Discipline creates confidence. Number two, self-acceptance. And we're talking about the keys to confidence here. Self-acceptance. This is you looking at yourself in the mirror and being happy with what you see while at the same time, you may still be working on your game and looking to improve yourself. So there's a balance to be struck here is you look at yourself and you are happy about yourself. You're proud of yourself. You appreciate yourself while at the same time looking at yourself and saying, hey, I'm still I still have some work to do to make myself even better, even though I'm good right now. So you can accept yourself while still knowing that you have room to grow. This is how humility and confidence actually work together. So humility and confidence are not diametrically opposed. Some people talk about them as if they are, but they're actually not. Uh, one of my TED Talks, as a matter of fact, that I did in Las Vegas is titled Too Much Confidence is Not Your Problem. And in that talk, I talk about how humility and confidence actually work together. And me being an athlete, I'll give you a great example. If you think of any of you who's familiar with sports, even if you don't play, what do athletes do? Let's say uh, a football team. Football season's coming up soon. What do football players do all during the week from Tuesday through Saturday most of the time? What are they doing? That's excluding the Thursday night games. What are they, they're practicing, right? They practice all week. They do all that practice all week so that when they get to the game on Sunday, they are confident and they're feeling bold and they're putting themselves out there and they go and they hopefully they play their game and hopefully you know, the home team wins. But what, are, that, what they're doing Tuesday through Saturday is displaying the humility to know that they have to do the work to make themselves better so that they afford themselves the right to be confident on Sunday. They're confident on Sunday during the game because they were humble enough to do the work Tuesday through Saturday. Everybody follow what I'm saying here? So humility and confidence are not diametrically opposed. They actually support each other. The more humble somebody is, usually the more confident they are because the, hum the humility is what drives them to go to the gym, to do the work, to sit down at the computer, to go to the library, to read the books, to hire the coaches, to take the courses, to get the information so that when it's time to perform, they're completely confident and there's nothing that they need to think about. So understanding that that confidence to go out and perform the thing that the thing that they do and produce positive results for themselves and for others is based in that humility. So this is what great athletes do. This is what great performers do. This is what great entrepreneurs do. They can perform at a high level during the game because they've earned it through humility. Now, it does not mean that you're perfect, which is why right after the game on Sunday, what does the football player do? They're right back at practice the next week. The same thing that we do. We get off the stage after giving a great performance or you get out of the boardroom at their closing a big deal, you go right back to doing the work so that you afford yourself to be just as good when it's time to deliver and when it's time to make the next sale. So that second point is self-acceptance. Number three, we're talking keys to confidence. Number three is goals. Goals are simply your expectations of future success. That's what a goal is. It is an expectation of future success. 
when you set a goal, you are expecting to be successful in the future, and you are simply giving yourself a target and an aim for reaching that success as a way of measuring your achievement towards the success. That's what a goal is. You're giving yourself a target and an aim and a measurement so that you know you reach the goal. Successful people all have goals, and people who do not have goals cannot become successful because there's nothing to aim for. It's like playing, the ba playing basketball without a basket. All right, you can't score if there's no goal. So by nature, you're losing if you don't have a goal. And people who lose consistently, we will call them, harking back to what Ramon talked about in his segment, we will call them losers. Why? Because there's no way for them to win. All right, and th this is, these are diametrically opposed. All right, this is a binary. You're either one or you're the other. To build and maintain confidence, you must set goals for yourself. You get disciplined in going after them. You put a structure in place that supports the discipline. So structure creates discipline, discipline creates confidence, and you will be a more confident individual because you know exactly what you're working on and you can see your progress on your path to success. So you can be confident while still working on a goal that you have not yet reached as long as you follow this process. And that this is an important point that I want to make sure I throw in here. You do not have to have reached all your goals to be confident. You can be confident while you're in the process of working on a goal and how the goal supports that is that when you have goals, you can see, all right, here's where I was. I was 10% of the way to the goal. Now I'm 30% of the way. Now I'm 60% of the way. So you can see the progress happening. So you have a real reason to have the goal. There's a tangible, excuse me, to have the confidence. There's a tangible, there's tangible substance behind your confidence because you are doing the work, because there's a structure and because there's a process and you can see the progress happening while it's happening. So this is how goals support confidence. Number four, we are talking here keys to confidence for those who came in the middle. Number four, competence and skill. All right, this is the game part. All right, when we say work on your game, this is the game. Competence and skill. So game is just a, a euphemism for ability. And the first part of this, in the first uh, three points here, we talked about structure, discipline, goals, and doing the work. All of these things contribute to what? Confidence. Why? Because confidence is supported by competence. Confidence is supported by competence. So it's one thing to be confident and there's nothing behind it. It's another thing to be confident when you know you've done the work. Again, go back to the analogy of the, the football player who practices all week. When it comes to the game on Sunday, they don't have to think about it because they did the work. So it's hard to be confident in something when you know that you're not good at it or you are questioning whether you are good at it. So as any of you put a one in the chat, you ever been in a situation where you were it was time for you to perform or deliver. Let's say you were about to give a speech or you're about to go into a sales conversation or you had a game to play. You're playing a sport and you were questioning your ability like right before the event started. Put the number one in the chat. Any of you have ever felt that any of you ever been in that situation? As a matter of fact, that same TED talk that I just referred to the one I did in Las Vegas titled Too Much Confidence is Not Your Problem. Of all the four TED Talks I did, that one had the shortest time frame between the time I was told that I was going to be speaking and the time that I had to actually speak. It was about four weeks. They told me about four weeks out, hey, uh, we want you to come speak at this this event. And the other events I've done, I was I knew like six months in advance. This one I knew four weeks in advance. And there was very little uh, prep time. They didn't do any like rehearsals or anything with us. So like 10 minutes before I was to go on stage and speak, I wasn't sure. I knew everything that I was going to say. I was still rehearsing my speech right before I went on the stage. So I have had this happen before. But when the lights came on, I went out there and performed. And you can find that talk at if you just go to work on your game dot com slash Ted T E D. You can see that in my other three talks and it came out perfect. But anyway, the whole point is you don't want to be in this situation. All right? I didn't want to do that. My normal standard is I'm way prepared way ahead of time, but I was not that time. So some of you I'm looking in the chat. OK, so a bunch of you have had that happen before. So. You don't want to think you don't want to be in that situation because often they don't go too well. So I got I wouldn't even say lucky, but it, it worked out. Let's just call it that. But I would not repeat that that uh, situation. So having competence and skill are strong supporting foundations of confidence. Remember what confidence is, your ability to do something, your belief in your ability to do something. Now, when you know you can do it, you only have to you don't even have to worry about belief. Knowing is a higher level than believing. See. When you know, that's even stronger energy. So do you believe in your ability to, for example, how many people here believe in your ability to walk or run or to tie your shoes? Uh, most of you don't believe in that. You know you can do it. Uh, you don't have to believe. Uh, you just know you can do it to the point that you don't have to think about it. That's the level of competence you want to get to. Number five, we're talking keys to confidence. Number five, preparation and practice. All right, this is the work. 
All right, so we call it work on your game. All right, each one of these words has earned their way into the into the, the framework here. Work. This is the work. Preparation and practice. What supports your competence and skill? Doing the work. This is where the preparation and the practice come in. And this is one of the foundational pieces of what work on your game is all about. When I was an athlete, for example, I would tell the ball players, because that's how I, when I first came on the internet, was I used to make all these all this content for basketball players. And I told them I had a 10 to 1 ratio when it came to practices to games. And that's any kind of game, whether that was a professional game, a pickup game, a three on three, a place somebody one on one at the local park. I spent 10 hours practicing for every one game that I played in, any kind of game. And that was the work. That was the foundation for me having the game, which led to the confidence, which led to the performance, which led to the results, which led to the rewards. Right, you see how all these pieces work together? So when you are continually working on your game, preparing and practicing, that will make you sufficiently competent, which allows you to be confident. So that's how all these pieces work. The best professionals at anything are continually preparing and practicing for what they do, even though they are already better than 99% of the population at that thing. Let me ask a question. How many professional speakers we got in the room? I know some of you are professional speakers. So let me ask this question. I want you to put the number two in the chat. If you are a professional speaker and and you give you have some signature speeches, in other words, you might do 20 paid speaking gigs, but it's not like you're doing 20 different speeches. You have some signature speeches and wait, don't put the two in the chat yet. You're a professional speaker. You have some signature speeches, meaning you give this a similar speech more than once. And even though you've given the speech before, you still practice the speech before you get on stage. When you give the same speech that you've given before, you've given it 10 times, 20 times, 30 times before, you got paid to give the speech again, but you still rehearse it before you go on the stage the next time. Put the number two in the chat if I just described you. Professional speaker, you have given the same speech more than once, you're gonna give that same speech again, but you still practice the speech before you give it the next time, even though you've given it 25 times already. Put the number two in the chat if I just described you. Okay, so I see a, a few of you. Let me see, Dr. Jeannie, yes. Monica, yes. Anybody else? All right, nobody else? All right, Luis, okay, I see you, Luis. Anybody else, any other professional speakers? You practice the speech even though you've given it before already? All right, I see Aswan over there on, uh, on IG, I appreciate you. So this is, what, this is the preparation work, all right? This is the preparation work, is that even though you've done it before, you keep doing it. Let me ask you a question. Think about this. The best athletes who are good at dribbling or shooting a basketball, you notice that they're always working on dribbling and shooting a basketball, even though they're very good at it. Who's the best shooter in basketball right now? Any of you plays ball? Even if you don't play ball, most of you know the answer is this guy named Stephen Curry, right? Now, let me ask a question. Is there any basketball player in the NBA right now who practices shooting more than Stephen Curry? Even though we don't know. I mean, we don't know how, it, how people practice. It's not on TV. I would bet that the answer is no. I would bet that Steph Curry practices shooting more than any other player practices shooting, even though he's already better than everybody else at shooting. Do you think that's a coincidence? That's not a coincidence. The people who are the best at the thing are usually the ones who are practicing the thing the most. So even though they're already better than everybody, they don't take their foot off the gas. They actually press harder on the gas. That's how they stay good. All right, this is not, it's not magic, folks. It's, it's simple structure, it's simple process. And any of us can do this. Number six. We are talking the keys to confidence. We got 15 here and I got 10 minutes. So again, I'm going pretty quickly here. Number six, positive self-talk. Self-talk is the conversation you are having in your head with yourself about yourself. And it matters what the people around you say about you and what they say to you. Yes, it does matter who the other people are in your life and how they're talking to you. This is why the law of association exists. However, what you say to yourself has 100 times more impact than what anybody else says to or about you. Let me repeat that because this is very important. What you say to yourself has 100 times the impact of what anyone else says to or about you. Why? Because if somebody else says something to you, the only way it can affect you is if you accept it and internalize it. If somebody tells me that I have blue hair and you're watching me on Instagram, then you know that would be ridiculous that, first of all, for my hair to be blue, secondly, for there to be Actually, I do have hair. If I don't shave, then I would have hair. But if somebody told me I had blue hair, it wouldn't affect me at all. Why? Because I wouldn't accept it. I would completely, I would completely reject it. Not even, I wouldn't even consume it deep enough to even have to reject it. It would immediately bounce off me. It wouldn't matter at all. But if I'm telling myself anything over and over again, that matters a ton. So this is the self conversation. And let's be clear about something, folks. The self conversation is simply thinking. This is not 
you actually speaking, even though we can speak to ourselves, thinking is a self-conversation. What are your thoughts? What are you thinking about yourself? What do you see when you look in the mirror? All right, this is very important. This is why I have a book called The Mirror of Motivation. As a matter of fact, I'll change the link here to my book, The Mirror of Motivation, right now. This book is all about you looking in the mirror and having that conversation with yourself because this is the most important conversation you will ever have in your life. I don't care what other people you have in your life, how impactful they are, how much you look up to them, how much you love them, care for them, and value what they have to say. Nothing anyone else says matters more than what you say. So this is the, I believe it was Jack Canfield, who's one of the authors of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series or the creators of that series. He talked about this concept of Velcro. Everybody knows how Velcro works, right? Velcro has, it needs two pieces. You got the, the hard plastic piece and you got the little foamy piece, right? The only way any thought from the outside world can actually matter to you is if there's a piece of Velcro, the little foam piece on the inside of you that allows it to stick to it. If there's no other piece in there, then whatever comes from the outside world cannot stick. I talk about this concept, I call it through the bones. If any of you ever uh, sings in the shower, maybe you don't sing in public, but you sing in the shower, you notice how your voice sounds different than if you listen to yourself on a recorded device. Like if I listen back to this segment right here, it's gonna sound different than how it sounds to me right now. Why? Because sound that travels through the air is conducted, sound that travels from other people is conducted through the air. Even sound that comes through headphones, it has to go through air in order to get to your brain. But the sounds that you say, the things that you verbally say yourself, they travel through bones because they're going straight through your internal system. So sound that travels through bone sounds different than sound that's conducted through air. So the sound that comes through the bones is the most important sound that matters in your life because that's what you are saying to yourself. And everything you say to yourself is affecting your confidence immensely, either positively or negatively. There is no neutral. All right, this is a binary positive or negative. Every single thing that you say, you're either making an investment into your, you're making a deposit, excuse me, into your confidence bank account, or you're making a withdrawal with every single thought, every single word that you have about and to yourself. Number seven, we are talking keys to confidence. Number seven, embracing challenges. Confident people don't always get it right, and they don't win every single time that they do things, but they're willing to try. They're willing to get in the game and give it a shot. They are willing to embrace the challenge. And even if they lose, they learn from it. I mean, you either win or you learn, as they say. And confident people usually end up winning more often than they lose. Or the times that they win more than makes up for the times that they lose in multiples. So Amazon talks about this. If you ever read Amazon's uh, principles for their leaders, and they have this posted on their website, so you all should look this up and read it. And they talk about how at Amazon, People who are in the leadership positions win more often than they lose. They're right more often than they're wrong in terms of their ideas and their executions. And if all your and also your wins need to be wins where you actually you got to step up to a challenge. You got to try something that's not a guaranteed W, as we say. W just stands for win. If all your wins are the easy type where you're not really challenged, well, that win is not as valuable as the one when you had to dig deep into yourself. I'll tell you something about being a champion. I posted this on Instagram a few days ago. You're not a champion in life until you're in a situation where it looks like you're going to lose and you win. That's what makes you a champion. Not you getting a whole bunch of easy, easy battles and you beat everybody. It's when you put yourself in a situation or you end up in a situation where it looks like you're going to lose and you win. That's how you build real confidence. Number eight, we are talking keys to confidence. Positive influences. This is the law of association and action when it comes to confidence. Positive influence are not limited just to other people but other people are a part of this. These are things that you think, things that you read, look, watch, where you hang out, who are your environments, anything else outside of your physical person that has an effect on you. All of this is part of your positive environment and part of the positive influences that you can have around you. So some of you who are into sports or you're some type of performer, before your performances, uh, any of you who, any of you does any kind of performance, whether on stage, um, online, or any of you plays a sport, whether recreationally, you play professionally, something like that, do all of you have some kind of routine or something that you do before you perform? Put the number three in the chat. If you have a pre-performance routine, whether you are, whether that's before you're one of your sales calls, whether it's before you step on the stage to speak, whether it's um, anything else that you do where you're performing, whether you sing, whether you dance, whether you play a a sport. I don't care if your sport is you just go swimming every day by yourself and nobody else sees it, but you have a pre-performance routine. Put the number three in the chat if you have a pre-performance routine. Okay, so a bunch of you have that. 
And what is that? What is a pre-performance routine? It's you giving yourself some positive influences to remind your subconscious it's time to go to work. It's time to go do the thing that I prepared myself to do. Those positive influences get you ready to get into your zone, your flow, so you can do what you need to do. Number nine, self-care. We're talking keys to confidence here. Self-care. Confident people take care of themselves. All right. Is that, that shouldn't be news to anybody. That means they get enough rest. They pay attention to what they put in their bodies. They are conscientious about what influences they have around them, things that are either pulling them up or bringing them down. Again, keeping in mind, folks, there is no neutral in the universe. The universe is not neutral. You are either making yourself better, you're making yourself worse. You are building or destroying at all times. Confident people take care of themselves by not abusing their bodies. They don't abuse their minds. And they take care of themselves by doing things like exercise, meditation, strengthening their immune system. And they practice self-care by using the addition by subtraction method, which means they get rid of things that are bringing them down, which uh, brings them up by, uh, by default. Simply meaning they don't do things that mess themselves up. All right. Confident people do not mess themselves up on purpose. They do not harm themselves. Number 10, we are talking keys to confidence. Number 10, stepping out of your comfort zone. All right. Connected to this point about embracing challenges. Confident people are willing to do things that are outside of their normal realm of operation, understanding they will either succeed or they will stay there until they figure out how to succeed. That means they are willing to challenge themselves in unfamiliar terrain and figure it out as they go along. This is one of the reasons why they are confident, because they do this on a regular basis and it builds in their minds a track record of identifying, meeting and overcoming challenges. Understand that you can't be challenged unless you step out of your comfort zone. You're doing things that you're used to doing is not a challenge. That doesn't mean it can't maintain. You can maintain doing things you're used to doing. But the only way you get challenged is by stepping outside of your comfort zone. So confident people never get stuck in their ways, never get married to the old way of doing things just because it's the old way. Doesn't mean they're not disciplined, but they are willing to step into new spaces within reason when it can present an opportunity for growth. Number 11. We're talking keys to confidence, celebrating success. Confident people are driven because they have goals and they are always looking to move themselves forward. Yet that does not mean that they do not recognize and appreciate themselves for the successes that they have achieved. The difference with confident people is that they don't rest on their laurels when they're successful. They recognize their success. They appreciate their success. It doesn't mean, but they don't just sit there and smell the flowers for the next six months. They appreciate themselves. They celebrate. Then they get back to work mentally, if not physically on the next goal and the next thing to be accomplished. So I can celebrate winning an athletic competition or hitting a business milestone, but I'm already, you know, when the, the champagne's drying, I'm already thinking about what's the next competition, what's the next milestone. So that means you already have a next goal set, even though you already hit the previous goal. Speaking of such, number 12, we we're talking keys to confidence. Number 12, consistent progress. Confident people are always moving forward. Consistent progress requires consistent goal setting. As you get close to reaching one goal, you're already setting the next goal. That way you can strive for progress and always have new things to aim for because confident people are continually looking and reminding themselves of their goals, setting new goals as they hit the old goal. So why else are you here if you're not going to set goals and move yourself forward? Confident people stay confident because they pay for their confidence membership, so to speak, by continually getting better. And understanding that confidence is a membership it's a, a continuous payment thing. It's, it's a continuity payment. It's not a one-time payment. So it's kind of like your, your phone bill or your gym membership or your insurance payments. It's not something you buy one time. You got to keep paying it over and over and over again. Number 13, we're talking keys to confidence. Three more left. Body language and posture. You can tell a person's confident by the way they walk into a room, by the way they sit down in the chair, by the way they carry themselves physically. Confident people usually have their chest out, chin up, eyes forward. They make eye contact with other people. They have positive and confident body language. You can tell somebody's confident without them saying a word. Same way you can tell somebody is not confident without them saying a word. So with this in mind, you should, first of all, become more conscientious about what your body language is saying about you, because people are reading that off of you and making judgments about you, even though you haven't said anything. All right. People are reading this on you at all times and they're making subconscious judgments. So next time you're out in public or any of you who's out in public right now, look around, just people watch, gauge people's level of confidence just by looking at their body language. You can play this as a game. So next time you're in an airport or a train station or a Starbucks or anywhere there's a lot of people, just look around at the people and see if you can tell how confident they are with themselves just by the way that they're carrying themselves. Not by anything that they said. And keep in mind that the human body tells a lot more truth than the human mouth does. All right? We learn by about age eight to lie with our words. It's much harder to lie with our bodies. Number 14, we are talking keys to confidence. 
Personal appearance. Connected to posture is personal appearance. How do you show up? Understand people are judging you based on how you show up. How do you dress? How's your makeup done, ladies? How's your hairstyle? How, have you shaved in the last three days, gentlemen? What kind of sneakers are you wearing? Are your clothes clean and pressed? What kind of physical shape are you in? What does your facial expression say about you? All of these things are nonverbal communication clues, cues, excuse me, that people are picking up about you and they are making split second decisions about you based on these things. So when you go to a job interview, for example, this is one thing that I remember from college. We had to take it. We had to do an internship to get a, get a degree, business degree. And we did these um, practice job interviews. And the teacher from that class, she said they had this thing called the rules of 12. And the rules of 12 meant, from, at least from what I remember of it, and I may be butchering this, but the people who are holding the job interview, when you walk into the room, they notice three things. Number one, the top 12 inches from the top of your head down to your collarbone. Number two, the 12 inches from the floor up through your calf muscles. So in other words, they're looking at your shoes and your, your, cuff, your pants cuffs, at least for gentlemen. And then they're judging your energy in the first 12 seconds of engagement. And that plays a big role in whether or not you get hired for the job or you get to move on to the next stage of the application or interview process. The rules of 12. 12 inches from the top, 12 inches from the bottom in the first 12 seconds. You should pay attention to this because this is the communication you're making with the world. Keeping in mind that most communication, folks, is nonverbal. It is not our words. Number 15, last one, practicing assertiveness. Confident people are going to assert themselves. Why? Because they believe in what they are saying, thinking, and representing. Assertiveness does not necessarily mean being combative, but a confident person is willing to be combative if necessary. Assertiveness just means you are standing on what you believe, you're confident about it, and you're firm in it. And since so many people in today's world lack confidence and lack belief in anything, the assertive person is usually able to influence and direct circumstances simply by the law of contrast. Assertive people usually get other people to listen to them and follow them simply because assertive people assume leadership roles. Even if they don't have a leadership title, they assume a leadership role because of their energy. And assertiveness and leadership usually comes a package deal with responsibility, which is something that many people don't want. That's why many people are willing to follow the assertive person because they don't want the responsibility that comes with leadership. So confident people are usually pretty assertive and they're usually the leaders. So if you look around the room, you find the leaders, they're usually the most assertive people in the room. That is not by accident. So let me recap. I'm going to recap these really, really quickly. Then we're going to open the floor for a couple of short shares, like 30 seconds apiece. So we're going to practice brevity here, and then we're going to get into professional development. So keys to confidence. Number one, positive mindset. Number two, self-acceptance. Number three, goals. Number four, competence and skill. Number five, preparation and practice. Number six, positive self-talk. Number seven, embracing change, challenges, excuse me. Number eight, positive influences. Number nine, self-care. Number 10, stepping out of your comfort zone. Number 11, celebrating success. Number 12, consistent progress. Number 13, body language and posture. Number 14, personal appearance. Number 15, practicing assertiveness. So let's open the floor for a couple short shares, like 30 seconds a piece, and then we will move on to professional development. Mike's open. Hey, Dre. Hey, really quick. Good morning. Good morning. Listen, think about, like, when you think about wrestlers, one mm -hmm. of the greatest of all time, the first name that comes to mind is Ric Flair. Like, think about how long <laughs> yeah. he's been technically retired, but his toys are still selling right now. Because you know, <laughs> like I know, if you've ever seen a promo by him, he exuded what? That confidence. That's what drew me. So, yeah, whatever. great energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ric Flair. I, I remember Hulk Hogan. I, I like Hulk Hogan more than I like Ric Flair. But I remember Hulk Hogan, he'd be getting beat up, and then he would start holding his arm up, then he would get up, and then he would always win the fight. I never saw Hulk Hogan lose a fight. But, yeah, shout out to Ric Flair, too. Thank you for that share. All right, anybody else? Going once, going twice. Sold. All right, now let's get into the professional development side. We are. I'm going to give you two topics here and give you all a chance to. Uh, Jerry, I'm not sure if you heard. Someone was trying to chime in while you were doing your countdown. I'm not sure who it was. Oh, who was that? Yeah, who was that? Go ahead. Dr. Emerald. Hey, Emerald. Good morning. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, go. Okay, great. Um, great shares. And I think um, what you pointed out with your voice and going and hearing ourselves is different than what everyone else hears. And that's right. a point of um, fear for me. And, and it's hard for me to listen to myself, um, not to my own ears. So that's something that I know I have to get over, but that's something that you pointed out that's excellent. Thanks. Yes, the sound, the sound that travels through the bones, a very important point because that's a, and I appreciate you pointing that out, uh, Dr. Emerald, because that is, uh, that internal conversation is the most important conversation. So when we get that one right, then the conversation we have with everybody else becomes a lot easier, a lot smoother. So I'm glad you pointed that out. So now, 
All right, appreciate everybody for jumping in on that. Now we got about 24 minutes here. So the two topics that I'm gonna have you all vote on, you're gonna vote in the, in the comment section here on Clubhouse is professional development. So we got two, we got business in a, is a contact sport. So put C for contact sport and contact sport is just a uh, metaphor. And the other one is how to be your own public relations team. So you can put the letter P for public relations. So C for contact sport, why business is a contact sport. For those of you who don't know what that means, it just means a sport where physical contact is allowed. So think football, think basketball, think hockey, boxing, baseball. There's some contact in baseball. Or how to be your own public relations team, put the letter P. If you want to learn how to do your own PR, put the letter P in the comment section. So C for contact sport, why is business a, why am I a meta, why am I drawing a metaphor between contact sports like boxing and football to business? I'll explain that. Or how to be on public relations team. So C for contact sport, P for public relations. Okay, so public relations is winning a lot. So let's get into that. How to do your own public relations. All right, here we go. All right, so we got about 20-ish minutes. Let's get through this. So hopefully I can leave some time for a uh, conversation. So let me tell you a story first. 2015. This was the year that I stopped playing uh, pro basketball. I wanted to get myself out there and get known, but I had a challenge. Challenge was, even though I'd been creating content for 10 years and I had a nice size audience, I'd already been, uh, I'd already been an entrepreneur. I was already selling products. That my, the challenge was most of my audience was athletes. And if you look me up on the internet at that time, most of the stuff that my name was connected to, 99% of it was basketball. But I knew I didn't want to stay in the basketball space. I started creating content around mindset around 2010. So I had started to build this audience of people who were not athletes because they saw the mindset stuff that I was making for athletes. But they said, hey, Dre, I know you made this for the ball players, but this applies to everybody. So that was the direction that I wanted to go. I wanted to take the mindset stuff and start applying it to people who didn't play sports because it was a much wider audience. Plus, I knew that I could be I wasn't going to stay relevant to basketball players simply because I wasn't going to be playing basketball every day anymore. So how I decided to address this challenge was I was going to hire a PR agency. I was going to get myself known by hiring a PR company that could help me get seen. And by the way, while I'm uh, telling you this story, I'm putting a number to my daily motivation text message, which I send out every day for free. You want to get that, just text me at that number that you see in the chat. I just put 305-384-6894. So anyway, I hired this PR company down here in South Florida and Long story short, ended up being a waste. It was not useful. I fired them after about three months. And I remember I got a nasty email from the main guy's uh, assistant. His executive assistant emailed me. I called the main guy, fired him over the phone. And then about three hours later, the main guy's executive assistant sent me an email, a nasty email telling me, hey, PR is in a, basically wagging her finger at me. PR is an investment. You no, know, getting yourself seen and known is not free. We worked hard for you et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I thanked her for her kind words. And the whole point is, <laughs> and it led to what we're going to talk about here today, that th that company had not faced the reality that I'm going to be sharing here today. Now, I want to offer a disclaimer before I get into these points, that what I'm about to share with you is not necessarily telling you that public relations as an industry is a bad industry or that it is a bad idea for you to hire a public relations company, because there are some of them who are actually very good. There are cases where maybe you would benefit from hiring an agency. However, I will also say you could do it on your own and get yourself known. And I'm going to explain to you how here today. And you can make your own uh, value judgments as to whether that makes sense for you or not. So how to be your own PR company. Here are the things that you need to do. Number one, you need to have a compelling presentation. All right. Nobody. And when I say nobody, I mean any platforms that might give you attention do not want to cover you or give you attention if you are uninteresting there needs to be something interesting about you and by the way you can help them by letting them know what the interesting thing is or things are about you that makes your presentation compelling you have to let people know hey here's why you should book me for your stage here's why you should have me as a guest on your podcast here's why you should have me write a guest blog post on your website. All right. There needs to be something about you that is attention grabbing and interesting that their audience would be interested in. And again, you don't need to hope that they figure it out. 
Don't just put it out there and let it sit there and hope that people find it. Your job is to go to them and let them know that it's there. All right. And the biggest thing these days, because all of us with our businesses, especially if you're using social media, is that it's very personality driven. Even if your company is not based on a personality, the company itself can have a personality. All right, the business needs to have a personality. And as long as you keep as long as you have that personality, you can get people to pay attention to you. The business can have the personality to get people to pay attention. But you have to have a compelling presentation. It has to be something compelling about it. Compelling just means your ability to move someone to action. And in case any of you has never thought about that, let me tell you what really compels people is. Emotion. Emotion is a strong component, if that's even a word. You want to compel people, you need emotion, you need energy. It needs to be something about your story that people say, wow, what's the wow in your story? What's the wow in your background? What's the thing about you or your brand or your business or your product or your service or your event or whatever it is that you're offering that you want people to talk about, that you want them to cover and pay attention to that makes people say, wow, that's interesting. Wow, I never thought about it that way. Wow, that's different. Wow, that's nobody else can say that. What is the wow in your presentation? That's the number one thing that you need for any kind of public relations, because if you're going to if you were to hire a public relations company, that's the first thing they're either going to ask you or they're going to try to figure out. And if they don't have it, they're going to try to create it and they're probably going to ask you to help them. What is it about you that makes you interesting that will make somebody else want to pay attention to you? All right. What is the wow in your presentation? That's number one. Number two. We are talking how to be your own public relations company. Learn how to pitch. P-I-T-C-H. Pitch. This is the sales part of public relations. And this is what any public relations company or a public relations person that you hire. This is 80% of the game right here. Selling. They have to sell you. So even if they have a ton of contacts and they say, hey, we got all these contacts. And I've had many public relations companies reach out to me. I've had conversations with many. And they tell me, well, how many contacts they have and how many people they know. And I got this network of 10,000 magazines and podcasts, and radio shows, et cetera, et cetera. And all the contacts that they have. And they're not lying. They have all that thing, those things. But the thing is, as soon as they decide to take you on as a client, now here's what they got to do. Now they have to take you, the new client, and they got to get all those contacts to give a damn about you. They have to pitch you. Now, some of this can be uh, handled by the fact that there's a relationship. So they may be able to pull, call some favors, even if they have a very uncompelling client. At the same time, they can't keep doing that forever. All right. At some point, there has to be something about that pitch that makes it interesting. 80 percent of the game is your ability to pitch and sell yourself. So the reason that I've done four TED Talks, the reason that I've been on the 300 podcasts, the reason I played basketball overseas. Yes, I had the skill to do these things. And yes, I had a presentation, but many people have those things. They remain anonymous. The reason that I was able to do those things is because I know how to sell myself. Public relations is about your ability to sell yourself. If you can sell yourself, you can do your own public relations. You don't need to hire anybody. This is the crux of this whole conversation right here. If you can learn how to sell yourself, and that means taking the relevant parts of you that make you, going back to my first point, compelling and interesting to each individual's audience to whom you are reaching out to understand every audience is different. So if I'm reaching out to a uh, let's say I want to reach out to a, a basketball podcast and I want to be on their show and I want to talk about my career, then I'm going to emphasize some different things. than if I'm reaching out to an entrepreneurship podcast and different than if I'm reaching out to a mindset podcast, different than if I'm reaching out to a leadership uh, platform different than I want. If I want to go be a, a keynote speaker at a, a network marketing conference, but they all have different things that would be compelling to them based on who their audience is. So your job is to look at who you want to be covered by, who you want to pay attention to you and make you more public. Who is their audience? Why would their audience care? And what parts of your presentation would make their audience interested in you? That's the part you emphasize. That's the part you pitch. And that's how you sell yourself. If you can learn how to sell yourself, you don't need to hire anyone to do the sales for you. And by the way, those of you who are entrepreneurs or at least even if you are not an entrepreneur yet, whether you're doing side hustle, full time business or you're entrepreneurial minded and you just haven't gotten into it yet. Understand that your ability to pitch and influence and persuade people to do things, i.e. cover you, i.e. buy from you. This is the entire business. This is the business. If you can make the 
money move, you can make the register ring, or you can make pretty much anything happen in your business. But you have to learn how to sell yourself or sell your product, sell your service, sell your offer, sell your program, sell your company, whatever it happens to be. That is, that's your ability to sell yourself. There's a book by Oren Claff, O-R-E-N-K-L-A-F-F. The book is called Pitch Anything. And in that book, Oren talks about pitching. And he's talking about pitching kind of like uh, selling. I can't even remember exactly what he was selling in the book, but you can go get the book. It's called Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. And he talks about the different frameworks for selling and how there are different frames you can use in sales and how when you're making high stakes pitches, and he's talking about selling like million dollar deals, that the people who you're selling to, the buyers, these are very sophisticated professional buyers, are they have their own frames and they're going to, this like a, it's kind of like a chess match. So you have to learn how to deal with them the same way that they're looking at you. So that book is a really good high level game for any of you who want to learn more about selling yourself. And there are thousands of books out there on sales. Uh, I like Grant Cardone's stuff on pitching. He talks about it on a more, a more everyday level for any of you who's a solopreneur. Uh, Jim Edwards has a book called uh, Copywriting Secrets and copywriting, but even if those of you who don't like writing, Copy is simply when people say copywriting and uh, there's not copyright like the little C with the circle around it, not that type of copyright. Copywriting is in writing a book. Copy is simply the words that are used to influence or motivate or persuade someone specifically in sales. So when you drive by the highway, you see a billboard. All right, that's copy. The words on that billboard is copy. When you get an email from someone and there's a link at the bottom, they want you to click on it and go sign up for their course. The Email itself, the words in the email is copy. You go to a sales page. If you go to mirroromotivation.com, the pin link that we have here in Clubhouse right now, every word on that page is called copy. Why? Because those words are designed and intended to influence you to order the book. All right, so that's copy. All of you who wants to sell, if you want to do your own public relations, you must, must, this is not a suggestion, you must get good at copy. You must get good at using words to influence and persuade people to action because just telling them that you have something is not enough. Only about 2% of people will move on their own volition. You must move them. This is all, this is what PR is. It's moving people to action in whatever way that you can do it. So if you learn copywriting and which is doing it through the written word, which is a way that a lot of people make decisions. They like people believe what they see more than what they hear. So if you can put the words in writing more than you can just say it out loud, that'll move more people to action, by the way, because not everybody moves the first time they hear something. But you give it to them over and over and over again, they'll maybe move on to seventh or eighth thing. Human beings are lazy, just as a general rule. So learn how to pitch, learn how to sell yourself, learn how to get people to understand uh, what it is that you have, why it matters and why they should do something about it. What do you have? Why it matters? Why they should do something? Any kind of pitch you're doing, whether you're trying to land a, a $20,000 speaking gig, whether you're trying to sell somebody your $10 book, whether you're trying to go and appear on somebody's YouTube channel for free, you must nail all three of these. What do you have? Why does it matter? Why should they do something? If you can't answer all three questions, then the answer is no. So the challenge for any of you, think in 45 seconds or less, why should anybody give a damn about what you do? What do you have? Why does it matter? Why should they do something? Uh, Glenn Rudin, who speaks here on BWC, I believe on uh, Fridays, he talks about this often. He talks about the elevator pitch. I'm not necessarily saying this needs to be an elevator pitch, but you do have to have a pitch, period. Whether you're doing it in an elevator, you're doing it in a car ride, you're doing it on Uber, you're doing it on a plane. What do you have? Why does it matter? Why should somebody do something? Number three, we are talking how to be your own public relations company. Definition of public relations is the professional maintenance of a favorable public image by a company, organization, or famous person. Professional maintenance of a favorable public image by a company, organization, or famous person. Now understand this word famous is, let's, let's talk about that. Famous is relative. Fame is relative. So you could be, let's say you're a high level dentist. You might be the best dentist in the world. Now, when you go to Walmart, nobody knows who you are. In your home, you go to Walmart in your hometown, nobody knows you. But when you go to the, the dentist convention, the national dentist convention, whatever that's called, and there is one, by the way, there's conventions for damn near every profession. You are, you get mobbed. Right? You can't even go to the bathroom, right? Because everybody knows who you are. So fame is relative. 
You don't need to be famous to everybody in the world. You don't need to be a, a Kardashian or LeBron James. You just need to be famous to the people to whom the people whom you wish to influence, which ain't everybody. Most of us ain't, aren't trying to influence everybody. But if you are, well, then you need to be famous to everybody. You just got to be famous to the right people. So that's what public relations is. It's just a favorable public image. So here's the question. Breaking down that definition. What image would you like to project? What do you want people to think, feel, or say when they see you? When people hear you, what impression do you want them to get? How do you want, what do you want them to be thinking as they walk away from whatever it is that you've presented? That's public relations. What do you want to be known for? If people could know you for something, what is it? What do you want people to say about you when you're not in the room? And your name comes up in a conversation, you're not there. What do you want that conversation to be? If people could retain only one thing about you, what is it? If people could, could listen to you talk or read your stuff or listen to you in an interview or come across your material, whatever your material is, and they could retain one thing, what's the one thing that you want them to take with them? Because, by the way, if you give people 100 things about you, they're not going to remember all 100. They might remember two or three. What is the one thing you want them to keep? And how will you get that across? What's your what's going to be your strategy for getting that message across to those people? What is sticky about you? Sticky meaning the thing that they the thing that they're going to retain after everything that you said. Any of you who's a professional speaker, and many of you should know this, especially those of you who are experienced. You go on stage and speak for 60 minutes. People are going to remember maybe about 30 seconds of what you said a week later. <laughs> they'll remember a good amount of it while you're talking. They'll take notes. They'll write down everything you said. But about a week after you talk, say, hey, tell me what uh, Dr. Genie said on stage last week. They'll remember maybe about 30 seconds worth of your material. And everything else they remember past 30 seconds, they're going to mess it up. What is sticky about you? All, right, all these answers are key to you doing your own public relations. So just remember the definition of public relations and what it is, and that'll help you uh, know how you're going to do yours. And number four, last one. We're talking how to do your own public relations. Number four, be consistent. Professional maintenance, that's the definition of PR, professional maintenance of your image. This needs to happen on a consistent basis. PR is not something you do one time and it's done. Or you think about people who are well known. It, all of you think about people who you follow on online or people who you're in their worlds, whether you're a client of theirs or you just follow their material or you listen to their stuff or you read their books or you now, when they have something going on, you immediately go check it out, whatever it happens to be. Notice that they're always doing new stuff. They're always getting interviewed again. They always have some new content that came out. They always got a new episode of their podcast. They have a new book that they published. There's a new interview that they did. They have some new uh, initiative that they started. They are consistently staying in front of the world. All right. P public relations is consistent. And this is something if you go talk to a PR person who's trying to sell you on public relations, that's, what gonna, that's one of the things they're going to sell you on is that. Uh, you go do your business while I'm going to make sure, this is the PR person talking, I'm going to make sure that your name stays in the news. I'm going to make sure that your name stays in the headlines. You notice, think about people who are you know, world famous. These are people who are famous to everybody. Notice how their name stays in the headlines. Why? Do you think that's just some random thing? No, that's somebody's doing that. All right, somebody's making that happen. Uh, you know why the Kardashians name stay in the news? Because Chris Jenner is making sure their name stay in the news. She's making sure, right? Put a new picture out. Let's get something else happening. Let's make sure that we keep, keep that name circulating. Why? Because the circulation of that name keeps the money moving. All right. It keeps the register ringing. So this consistency matters. You have to be consistent in maintaining your image. So it, it, those of you who are not reading between the lines here, you're going to do your own PR. All right. This is a job that you need to add to whatever else you already have going on, or you need to have somebody doing this as a job. You must consistently be doing something that makes people pay attention to you. As an ongoing thing, this is one of the selling points. Again, PR people will use when they're selling you. They handle it so you don't have to. So if you're going to do your own PR, you got to stay in front of your public, whoever that public happens to be. Anybody here who's on my email list, all right, how often do you get emails from me? All right, if you're on my text message list, how often do you get text messages from me? You all are part of my public. I have to stay in front of you. I got to stay in front of you consistently. All right, over here working your game, we send out a million emails a month. All right, I send out text messages at least every single day. I do these live streams a lot. Of, a lot. I've put out reels on Instagram and TikTok and all the other platforms consistently. If you follow me on YouTube, those videos are coming out every day, more than once. If you listen to my podcast every day, I'm not saying you have to do it every day, 
but you need to be consistent enough that your audience doesn't forget that you exist. All right, this is all part of the job of PR. So let me recap these real quick, and then we'll open the floor for some discussion. How to be your own public relations company. Number one, have a compelling presentation. What about you is interesting and memorable? Number two, learn how to pitch. This is 80% of the game. You must be able to influence and persuade people to do what you want them to do. That's sales. Number three, public relations is professional maintenance of a favorable public image. How do you make sure that people remember that you exist? And number four, how do you do it? Be consistent. Professional maintenance needs to happen on a consistent basis. Again, a PR person will sell you on this. Hey, I will consistently handle you, your name staying in the news so that you don't have to handle your name staying in the news. The good news about the world that we live in today is that doing this yourself, you know who to target. And it's easy to reach people directly these days as opposed to back in the day when there were a lot of barriers to entry. So this is why uh, doing your own PR may be favorable for some of you. And also it's cost effective. You just got to substitute time and energy for money. So with all that said, let's open the floor up. Who has anything they want to share here? Uh, some short shares so we can get multiple people in on the subject of being your own public relations team. The mic is open. Hey, Dre, I got a question. It's Shantae. Hey, Shantae. Um, so with the posting regularly, mm -hmm. would you say, is it a few platforms or all platforms? Like, how should you handle that if you're on multiple platforms? Good question. When it comes to the platforms, I would focus on the platforms where your target audience is. So. I would backtrack and ask yourself is where is your target audience at and depending on where they are that's the platform that i would focus on or platforms that i would focus on and then um, time and space permitting expand to other platforms that's what i would do thank you sure thanks for asking uh, anyone else on the subject of being your own public relations team uh the we got two minutes here so Anyone else got a question, comment, share, anything you want to add to this? Anybody have any experience with public relations? Speak up. While I'm waiting, I see um, over on Instagram, Aswan asked a question, am I going to be doing these lives every morning? I don't always do them in the morning, Aswan. It depends on my schedule. But I do BWC every Monday morning. That's why I'm here now. Uh, who's that on Clubhouse speaking up? Yeah, hi, Trent. This is Denise Robinson. Hey, Denise, good morning. Uh, What do they need to do? Here's what I got. Here's why it matters. Here's what you need to do. do. Yes. Yeah, so, for example, hey, I have this book called The Mirror of Motivation. Here's why it matters, because this book's going to help you look in the mirror and ask yourself who's the best version of yourself you need to be so you can do what you need to do and have what you want to have. Here's what you need to do. Go to mirrormotivation.com. The book's free. Just cover the shipping, and I'll send it to you in a mailbox. All right, so it doesn't have to be some three-hour presentation. You can give people that in 30 seconds. It's just a matter of, you know, what's the format? Thank you. Sure. Thank you for asking. Hey, Dre, this is Jessica with the Lion Face. Hey, Jessica, good morning. Hey, um, a question I have for you is how to work with and leverage pay-to-play media and just, like, a plan around that. <laughs> good question. Give me an example, pay-to-play. Um, uh, being a part of a book anthology. Okay, good question. So pay to play, for those of you who don't know what that means, that's where you actually buy in with your money for uh, getting involved in something that could get you some attention. So for example, and this will be the last question I answered before I pass the mic. Uh, this, it depends on what it is. And when it comes to a book anthology, I would suggest that when it comes to that pay to play is that you leverage the fact that you're in the book. And of course, you want to get as many sales as possible from the book, but also with the other authors. See if you can leverage, hey, how can I get that other author to be on my YouTube channel or collaborate with me on an Instagram post? And some of them may have more followers or a bigger audience than you, or they have a bigger list than you. See if you can get them to talk about you in some way that is collaboratively and mutual, collaborative and mutually beneficial between you and them, since you already have some type of in with them. You have already have some kind of connection with them. So you can leverage the fact that there's a relationship there, and I would use that relationship. I don't know if necessarily the book itself is going to be that big of a thing for you. Depends on what the book is, but I would leverage the relationships with the other authors there because you already have an end with those people. Is that useful, Jessica? Definitely love that. Thanks. All right. Thank you for sharing. All right. We are right at 9.01. I'm passing the mic now to Angeline. Good morning, Angeline. Thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dre. What another amazing segment by 
everybody on IG. I will do these lives. Usually do these lives every day. It's not always at the same time. So y'all just stay tuned. Turn your notifications on. Y'all have a great Monday. Work on your game. Be out.